Hello and welcome to this virtual event to mark the launch of the 2022 Lowy Institute Pacific Aid Map. My name is Roland Ryder and I am the lead economist here at the Lowy Institute and the host for today's session. Before we begin, let me start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to our elders, both past and present. The Pacific Aid Map is a flagship research project for the Lowy Institute, led by my fantastic colleague, Alex Diant, who is a research fellow at the Lowy Institute and the lead researcher for the Pacific Aid Map. For today's session, Alex will be presenting very shortly on his key findings for the 2022 edition of the map. We will then have a panel discussion where Alex will be joined by two other expert guests whom I will introduce later on. The theme for our discussion today is managing regional crisis, competition and recovery. In particular, the 2022 edition of the map represents the first comprehensive picture of how aid and other development finance flows to the Pacific have, been, have responded and been reshaped by the COVID-19 pandemic. And I can say that the results are both fascinating and important for anyone interested in aid and development in the Pacific region. So without further delay, let me turn things over to Alex Tayant, who will present the key findings from the 2022 Lowy Institute Pacific Aid Map. Yeah, thanks, Roland. Well, yeah, so this is, uh, as Roland mentioned, this is the fifth edition of the Lowy Institute Pacific Aid Map. And for those who are watching at home and who are not uh, familiar with the aid map, this is the most comprehensive database on aid and development flows to the Pacific ever assembled. And so in this year's edition, we're covering uh, aid flows from 2008 to today. Um, and we're actually covering you know, more than 57,000 uh, different projects and activities um, that have been implemented by a range of donors. We have uh, 67 different donors uh, repatriated in the, in the aid map. And so we're looking at traditional donors like Australia, New Zealand. Uh, we're also looking at multilateral uh, development organization uh, like the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank. Um, but we're also looking at what we call non-traditional donors. So um, those could be China, Taiwan, and so forth. And this year, we're particularly excited uh, about this, year, this edition of the map because for the first time, as Roland mentioned, um, we really can analyze how you know, the international community and development partners have supported the Pacific uh, when the, the region was facing the dire consequences of, of COVID-19. But also, in this year's edition, we see how um, the pandemic has actually required development partners to uh, reconfigurate their, their aid uh, in order to support the, the region. So let's jump straight into it. The first thing to, uh, to notice in this year's edition of the map is that 2020 is the largest year on record uh, when it comes to um, development financing in the Pacific. So development financing is aid, uh, so grants, loans, and other, other financial assistance. And with more than $4 billion uh, disbursed in the Pacific in 2020, um, aid and development finances has increased by 47% uh, from its 2019 level. And it has actually more than doubled since the since 2008, which is the time where we started to uh, the, the Pacific Aid Map exercise. And so, you know, this is a massive jump, but it is, it is also justified. Um, the Pacific was hard hit uh, hit hard, sorry, by uh, by the pandemic. Um, as you can remember, you know, early in the crisis, the Pacific nations used uh, their their you know their isolation and their advantage to shelve themselves from the pandemic. Um, but because those nations are really um, are heavily reliant on, uh, you know, on external sources of income like trade and tourism, this came at a tremendous economic cost. Some Pacific nations faced an economic contraction of, uh, you know, two-digit numbers, economic contraction. And actually, the region as a whole um, has experienced, um, yeah, uh, uh, contracted by 6% according to, to the IMF. And so as a result, and what you can see in this graph is that, you know, that the international community reacted by uh, active, by, by providing a lot, of, um, a lot of support to the region. What's interesting to actually see in this, in this year's edition of the map, the map is the large increase, uh, that this large increase was primarily, primarily um, uh, driven by the massive increase in loans to the Pacific. So in 2008, loans represented around 18% of uh, financing flows to the Pacific. In 2020, they represent almost half of, of, um, of the financing to, to, uh, to the region. And so it looks like the pandemic has actually increased these trends that we've seen over the, the past decade. So when we look at where does the money go, well, it wouldn't come to, the, it's not a surprise to see that actually uh, most of the financing flows were going to uh, Melanesian countries. And this is, you know, in some ways justified. I mean, Papua New Guinea and Fiji together represent 
84% of the region's GDP and around 85% of the population. Um, but what I found surprising when I you know, started to collect all the information is to see like how important the financing flows directed to, um, to the compact state, you know, Micronesia, and, uh, and so the federal state of Micronesia and the Marshall Islands, were, the, those flows were important. They did really translate the fact that the United States has been very active when uh, border closure happens uh, to use basically the, the, the United States used the, 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 you know, the compact agreement trust funds to basically transfer enormous sums of money uh, to allow these countries to you know, um, keep on with their, uh, with their liquidity. Um, but actually, one was one, one of the most interesting findings is also that we realized that most of the financing was targeted to uh, most of the increase in financing was targeted to countries that received uh, that were highly dependent on on tourism. So uh, you know, you could see that Fiji and Palau, for instance, have almost uh, triple their their aid uh, have the, the the aid sorry to those countries to Fiji and Palau has almost tripled in 2020. But Nauru is also like another, you know, uh, country that relies heavily on on tourism. But Vanuatu entered the crisis in a very, um, in a very healthy, you know, economic situation. The the government has generated over the years uh, many budget surpluses, mostly generated by the sale of their uh, golden passports, uh, notably. Um, there are three countries that actually experienced a, a decrease in their aid in 2020. Um, so those were the Cook Islands, Solomon Islands, and Nauru. So what's interesting is that the Cook Islands actually graduated from ODA in 2019. And so it meant that it couldn't receive as much aid in 2020. So that was like bad timing for them. Then you had uh, the Solomon Islands and Nauru, both of them received large trenches of large financing trenches of uh, projects in 2019, which has created this kind of slump in from 2019 to 2020. But this doesn't mean that actually they haven't received any COVID support. On the contrary, they did receive quite a lot, but the amount that they received in 2019 was much more important. Um, <clears throat> so overall, what we see is that, you know, there was actually a dramatic uh, increase in development assistance to uh, the Pacific in the times of COVID-19. And what we've realized is actually that, um, you know, when we analyze the, 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 the data from the Pacific aid map is that most of the development increase in 2020 was actually coming from what we called, uh, what we have identified as COVID-19, uh, direct COVID-19 related projects. In fact, actually non-COVID-19 related projects um, have decreased from 2019 to 2020. And um, this is an interesting fact, this is an interesting fact because, um, you know, during COVID-19, during the pandemic, um, development partners faced project implementation limitation uh, caused by either border closure or health restriction measures. Um, and so there was, um, you know, in, in the fact of in, in the, you know, when, when those development partners faced this crisis, they had to, uh, you know, they had to reprioritize uh, funding. And so some existing projects, uh, some existing projects became lower priorities. Um, and so as a result, you know, like, uh, most development partners actually in the in the Pacific in the Pacific has, have experienced um, a reduction in the aid delivery in um, in 2020. Um, so the good thing in this in this year's Pacific aid map is that actually we have preliminary preliminary data for 2021. And so what it shows what this preliminary data, preliminary data shows is that actually you know most development partners shifted the aid in response to COVID-19, but with variable speed. So the Asian Development Bank, for instance, almost tripled its, uh, financing, uh, its financing budget in the Pacific in 2020 in comparison to 2019 levels. And as a result, and actually this is uh, the first time this happens in the Pacific aid map history, is that um, Australia, um, uh, the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, has become the first development partners to, uh, to uh, the Pacific in terms of um, uh, USD, uh, USD disbursed to the Pacific. And Australia for the first time is second when like um, in previous years, Australia was like the main development partners of the Pacific. Um, Australia and the World Bank, well, uh, they, have, they, were, they were slower to respond in 2020, but when they reacted and when they responded, um, they have actually responded very forcefully. So what you see is that, you know, in 2020, the, uh, the Australia provided this, um, 144 Australian dollars uh, loans to Papua New Guinea. In 2021, it provided another, uh, another loan, this time of $650 million uh, of direct, direct budget support to uh, PNG again. 
And this actually has become the largest trans transaction ever recorded in the Pacific 8 map. Um, so this, you know, this, um, this, loan, this, uh, this uh, increase is very significant. And actually, um, the loan uh, um, has become the largest uh, loan, sorry, financing to the Pacific has become like this very important means to uh, finance the economic recovery in the Pacific. Um, what you can also see in this graph is that actually, um, you know, I, I mentioned before that many of the development partners have experienced a reduction in their aid delivery in 2020. The peak in 2020 that you see from the 48 other development partners is actually mostly driven by additional loans provided by either um, Japan or more grant financing provided by the United States to their compact uh, to the compact of free association states in the North Pacific. And then what's interesting is to see that actually China, Chinese aid has reduced uh, over the years. Um, and that was surprising to us because you know China is the, has um, has become like the second the second largest development partners uh, of the Pacific over the years, and seeing that China was unreactive uh, to us was, was surprising. Um, so let's talk more about China. You know, uh, China's aggregate financing to the Pacific has continued to decline since it's peaked uh, since it peaked in uh, in in 2016 and. Um, and in fact, actually, in, 20, uh, in 2020, China had reached China's development program to the Pacific had reached uh, 187 million dollars, um, which is its lowest level uh, recorded so far in the Pacific Eight map since 2008. And actually, of those uh, of those 187 million, only five percent were directly allocated to COVID-19 uh, related support. Um, and so, you know, for us, like we did expect actually China to do way more than this in the Pacific at the time, uh, at the time of the pandemic. And so pre preliminary findings actually show that this trend is, uh, has been, you know, going on, uh, has continued actually in 2021. So why, why did this happen? Well, look, I mean, there is actually, um, there's, a, it's a, there's a supply and demand issue. So, on the, supply on the supply side, what's important to mention is that you know, China is actually facing um, an economic slowdown. My colleague Roland Raja wrote an economic, paper, an economic paper on this. And this means that actually, this economic slowdown means that actually there is less budgets allocated to development. And so this is why like, globally you see, for instance, like a, a decrease of Belt and Road Initiative, proje uh, Belt and Road Initiative projects. And this is something that you could also see in the, in the Pacific. So this is on the demand on the supply on the supply side. On the demand side, there are three components that uh, can explain the reduction in Chinese aid project in the Pacific. The first one is that um, you know the the, the 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 financing that China provides in the Pacific is usually um, directed towards infrastructure projects, but also financed through um, Exim Bank loans. And those loans are actually uh, pretty expensive when you compare the terms of those loans are expensive when you're comparing them uh, to um, to other uh, development partners. And so, you know, like in the time of uh, of reduced government revenues of after two years of pandemic, the, the 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 budgets in the Pacific have actually reduced. Fiscal space have reduced, and so Pacific nation can't really afford those type those type of projects. Um, there's also uh, the fact that you know, like Pacific nations have actually woken up to the quality, um, uh, the quality of Chinese aid projects and the quality of Chinese loans. I mean, um, you know, you've heard over the years that China was implementing, uh, you know, was building road to nowhere, um, building white, white uh, building elephants, uh, not white elephants. How do you call this? White elephants. White elephants, thank you very much. White elephants in, in, in the Pacific. And also, like, you, you know, in the Pacific, there is like um, the story of the Tonga, the Chinese debts held by Tonga that actually raises alarm bells. And so basically, there is a smaller and smaller appetite uh, for, for Chinese aid projects in the Pacific. And the third aspect um, in the supply side of why China's, uh, Chinese aid projects are going down in the Pacific is mostly due to the fact that you know, it becomes harder and harder to build infrastructure projects in the Pacific, and the competition is becoming stronger. Like in 2008, uh, China had to compete with the ADB and Japan for building new infrastructure projects. In 2020, 2021, now like there are many other development partners involved. Australia is actually is actually involved in, in infrastructure financing. We'll, we'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, but yeah, so it has become way more difficult for, for China to, um, 
to uh, you know uh, implement uh, projects in the Pacific. But this by no means means that China is actually off the region and that China is leaving the region. On the contrary, when you know what we've seen is that China had remained a key diplomat, a key diplomatic uh, tool for Beijing in the Pacific. Actually, new development financing um, has become more closely targeted to um, to specific countries, notably Kiribati and the Solomon Islands. Um, the two most recent uh, new Pacific Island countries diplomatic allies of uh, China. And in both of those countries, actually, China is not only taking, you know, taking on the projects or taking on like the, the sums uh, that Taiwan was financing in the Pacific, but actually they are like doing more. For instance, you see like in the Solomon Islands, not only, you know, they're, they're continuing to, to contribute to a local development initiative, but like they are contributing to even more projects in 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 the Pacific in in those in those nations. Um, so um, another interesting finding in this year's edition of the Pacific Aid Map is um, the need is that you know the need for immediate crisis response uh, in the Pacific saw actually an increase a dramatic increase in direct budget support to uh, to the Pacific. Over the years, many successful Australian and foreign government have actually tried to steer clear from uh, direct budget support. And this is for a few reasons. Like the first one is a, a fiduciary risk, you know, like, I mean, it, like there was a risk that the public resources were not uh, used in, for the in intended uh, purposes, or, you know, the, um, they, were, they were worried that the, the, the finances wouldn't be properly accounted for. And there was also like a question of the uh, a risk of development effectiveness, you know, like uh, with respect to absorption capacity, the quality of the project, and so forth. Um, but you know, in a time of border of border closure and travel restriction, direct budget support has become uh, the fastest mechanism to support the economies of of the Pacific. Actually, almost forty percent of development finances provided to the Pacific in uh, 2020 was in the forms of, uh, of direct budget support. And what's interesting is that actually 90% of those direct budget support were uh, provided under the form of loans. And all of the, most of those were actually directed towards uh, Fiji and, and Papua New Guinea. So, you know, um, the, the, there is clearly like a significant increase in uh, budget support and it's likely that it will continue uh, for some time given the weak economic outlook um, but also the weak, you know, outlook of the, the 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 recovery and the budget repairs in the region, and I guess this actually raises the question of of debt sustainability, debt sustainability in the Pacific. Um, that's the, the the debt situation in the Pacific has worsened during during the pandemic. Pacific nations draw on you know on domestic reserves and and limited government revenues um, to basically keep their economies afloat, but this has dramatically dramatically reduced uh, their available fiscal space. And so as a result, uh, as you can see in the left graph, um, most countries saw an increase in their gross public debt relative to, to GDP. Some countries you know, have actually managed to, uh, to reduce the debt to GDP. This is the case of, for instance, Nauru, that um, halved its public debts by implementing its uh, debt action plan to repay uh, its past obligation. But for other countries, and most importantly for Fiji, for instance, uh, the, the, the crisis has hit really hard. Uh, the, the country, and so as a result, it experienced um, a, a dramatic increase in its debt level, moving from 47% in uh, 2019 to 87% uh, in 2021. And this is why, you know, as you can see on the graph on the left, um, the overall IMF debt risk rating in the Pacific has really, really shifted towards, um, <clears throat> towards the red over the past few years. Actually, today, uh, seven out of 12 uh, Pacific Island countries are classified at high risk of debt distress. Two are moderate, um, while only three are considered as being in a sustainable situation. So this issue, of course, um, is the, the issue, of course, is that the Pacific, you know, will continue to, to, real, to, to need liquidity. And, and so loan financing uh, seems to be well anchored in the Pacific so far to be one of the mechanism that, that will secure this, this liquidity. And so this leads me to actually my last slides, um, which shows that you know, Australia um, is, is poised to become an increasingly uh, prominent lender to the Pacific at a time when debt sustainability in the region is already uh, precarious. So according to the ADB, the, the, the Pacific region is estimated to, um, to need around 3.1 billion US dollars 
per year in investment, uh, in infrastructure investment by uh, 2030. And uh, that's interesting because to, according to the Pacific aid map so far, in average, infrastructure commitments to the Pacific from the, the whole international community oscillates around 1 billion US dollars per year. Um, on its side, you know, Australia's commitments to infrastructure projects represent around 10% of its aid program, or that has represented around 10% of its aid program um, over the past uh, 10 years. Um, and so this, this represents around $100 million uh, per year of commitments. But, you know, in, 20, um, in, in 2018, the government, you know, the Australian government announced the, the Pacific Step Up, and one of the elements of the Pacific Step Up was the creation of the uh, Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, the AFP. Um, uh, and so the AFP was implemented in 2019 um, and we, with the goal of, you know, like providing a mix of grants and loans to the Pacific to support sustainable infrastructure in the Pacific. Um, and according to, you know, like our, our calculation, the AFP has so far uh, committed around $600 million in infrastructure project in the Pacific. And this implies actually a 60% uh, increase of infrastructure spending in the region and more is actually to be expected. You know, the, 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 loaning, the lending headroom of the uh, AFP now is around, what, 3 billion US, 3 billion Australian dollars? Australian. Yeah. Australian dollars. So, you know, like, um, it is clear that um, if, you know, if uh, Australia and other development partners want to do more, like, especially, I mean, Australia with the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, well, consider considerable care will be required in implementing new loans to avoid um, contributing to future debt problems in the Pacific. Uh, but anyway, so this is the end of my presentation. Uh, here I put the link of the Pacific Aid Map for you to have a look. Um, and if there are three things, three key things I want you to go home with uh, after this presentation, those are like the following. The first one is that, you know, co the COVID-19 pandemic has cemented the role of traditional development partners to the Pacific, especially multilateral development banks that have been very agile and very quick in responding to the, to the current crisis. But this doesn't mean by no mean that um, China is actually leaving the, the, the region. Um, it also, you know, like the, the COVID-19 pandemic has also turbocharged the use of direct budget support uh, to the Pacific. Now, like the, the, the debt situation has also worsened in, in the region. And so any development that will, uh, that wants to, that will want to use uh, concessional lending in the Pacific will have to do this with care, um, not to aggravate the situation. Okay, well, well thank you, Alex, for that. that excellent presentation with lots of uh, lots of fascinating insights which hopefully we will get to as part of this uh, panel discussion but there's a lot of there's a lot of material for I think people out there and very the yeah, public and analysts to, to really uh, chew through so you know that is of course the, the beauty of the aid map is that uh, you know you you and we can take away our, our key findings but actually there's a, an entire resource out there uh, for people uh, out in the world uh, to draw upon uh, so now we uh, move to the uh, panel discussion component of, of today's uh, event, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, two uh, very excellent additional guests to, to join us. Uh, the first is uh, Henry Cocker, who is a Sustainable Development Advisor at the Pacific Islands uh, Forum Secretariat, and uh, Henry has a wealth of experience working across the region in various uh, senior policy roles, and he is uh, joining us virtually today uh, from Suva. So uh, welcome, Henry. And uh, second is my other uh, excellent colleague, uh, Dr. Meg uh, Keane, who has recently joined the Lowy Institute as the new director of our Pacific Islands program and was previously the inaugural director of the Australia Pacific Security College at the Australian uh, National University. Uh, so welcome to you, Meg, uh, Thank as you. well. Uh, so Henry, uh, we might uh, start with you first, just to offer a bit of a perspective uh, from the region. So, you know, we've seen from Alex how um, aid and development finance and development partners have really sought to step up during you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and all the shocks that we've seen since that time. Uh, someone operating out of the region, I mean, how do you see the role that aid and development partners have played through what has obviously been a very difficult time uh, for the Pacific? You know, have there been particular things that you think have worked very well, um, things that maybe have not worked so well? What's your perspective? Uh, Vinaka, Roland, uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, and thank you so much to, the, um, to Alex and his presentation before that. 
but it's very interesting and uh, still learning a lot. <clears throat> but uh, I wanted to touch on that uh, question by saying that, um, by starting off by saying that uh, here in the Pacific, we, we have ongoing crisis. It's not only the uh, climate change or COVID-19, but we have disasters that hit us uh, every year. So uh, we are always in a state of, uh, of crisis here in the Pacific. So in terms of touching again on the, your question, uh, if you're referring to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, by, I mean, Dalvi here in the Pacific, it's still unfolding. Uh, we had the virus, we had the vaccination, we had the border lockdowns, we had the social hardships. And uh, Alex, uh, in his presentation, touched on the debt and economic issues that are, are now uh, at, uh, at our doorsteps now. Um, these, are, these are part and parcel of what, uh, the waves that we are now uh, experiencing here in the Pacific. This is on top of the climate change and ongoing disasters and uh, natural disasters that we have on a, an annual basis. Uh, the strengths that um, I see with the, um, the aid and, uh, and development partners, uh, it is good. Uh, some of the, um, the, uh, the strengths that I see is the greater focus, uh, greater attention in terms of the issues and vulnerabilities we are grappling with here in the Pacific. Um, we see uh, strengthened relationships with um, with um, with uh, uh, partners and uh, and relationships with new partners. Uh, these are all part and parcel of things that we are enjoying and uh, fully appreciate in terms of um, going forward. At the same time, by um, and Alex touched on his presentation uh, on this, uh, we see that with the new attention, renewed attention in the Pacific. Uh, there is now greater use of our, our, our budget process our, through budget supports that uh, translates to a greater understanding of our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities within our systems, our institutions, and how we can work together to further improve our capacity and uh, strengthen our institutions and processes. So that's a, a, a key strength I see already just based on the uh, discussion we've got so far. The weaknesses, uh, I guess there's uh, always going to be uh, pros and cons, and there's always going to be a work in progress in, in a number of issues. Um, the weaknesses I see is that uh, there's still room for better coordination, better communication, and for better collaboration uh, to help us uh, through the issues and crisis that uh, we endure on a daily basis. Oh, thank, thank you, uh, Henry. A lot of important points that, that you, you raised there. Of course, um, issues like donor coordination are becoming more difficult at a certain level as well. On the one hand, many partners are trying to coordinate, um, particularly the traditional development partners. On the other hand, you know, China has now become a large development partner, although that is, is there's a bit of flux there, as Alex has, has highlighted. So I want to turn to you, Meg, just around, uh, you know, as you know, and many know the you know, aid and development finance in the Pacific has been heavily affected by geopolitics affecting the region as well. Um, we saw from Alex's presentation, um, China's shrinking overall aggregate financing to the region, but that was also becoming more targeted in, in certain countries. And then we see other the traditional development partners trying to respond to all this. You know, how do you see, how do you see this picture in terms of how is it affecting development assistance uh, to the region? What does it all, what does it all mean? Well, it's a dynamic process. And I think that's also when we look at these trends, I mean, you can have dips, but they can be reversed very quickly. And we've seen that with the response to COVID. So we have a dynamic situation. I think there's also a difference between China's engagement and some of the traditional donors. It doesn't see itself as a donor. It sees itself as a South-South development partner. So it has a different mode of engagement. And in the face of COVID, it was less flexible, less able to respond. I think what we're also seeing with that dip is it's a reflection of return and risk for China. It is investing, it's a lender. Uh, it had to suspend some of the repayments on its aid, so the return was less, and so it needed to adjust accordingly. So I think we, we have to keep in mind that we have different modes of investment in the region, different modes of engagement, and they're going to respond different to a crisis. Alex highlighted that much of the surge we're seeing is in response to COVID, and yet we didn't see China responding to COVID. So I think that's important. There is more competition, 
and that gives more choice to the Pacific. So I think it is also important that this is not just a donor story. This is a story about Pacific Island country agency and choice and making rational choices in the face of the options in front of them. So recently in PNG, and it mentioned the fact that it hadn't taken loans for China for the last three years, there were simply more concessional loans and grants available, and it made that choice to go that route. We also saw when the new Prime Minister of Samoa took office, she looked at the potential for debt distress. She looked at the budget and made a decision that at this time, the loan that was on offer for by China for the port upgrade was not a sensible thing to pursue, perhaps in the future, not now. So we're seeing competition. We're seeing different assessments of risk and return, different modes of operation. But very importantly, uh, the Pacific Island countries making choices about what will serve their development interests best and they have more choices because there's competition mm. yeah no very very important points meg i mean are we still we also still at the same time see the um in Kiribati and in solomon islands that actually as alex showed in the in those charts china china's presence is is ramping up it's and it's it's actually quite uh, significant i wonder alex can you tell us you know what's what's underneath that exactly you know what is china doing in Kiribati and solomon islands and how has that sort of play it out in terms of, you know, Taiwan is a traditional partner and, and now China is coming in. Yeah, I think this is a good point. Like, um, I think when the, the diplomatic switch happened in 2019, a lot of people were wondering, you know, how, how much did it cost China to actually convince those countries to, to, to make this switch? And I guess like uh, what China was, do, was trying to, to do uh, was to look at what Taiwan had done over the past few years, uh, over the previous years in, in, in Kiribati and in, in Solomon Islands and try to basically replace them in some ways. And so what we see in the Solomon Islands is that actually China is contributing um, very much like what Taiwan used to do in the past. It's contributing to what you call the Constituency Development Fund, basically by providing direct funding to, uh, to uh, the government. Uh, and then the government can, you know, like con uh, members of parliament can use the, those funds for their own constituencies and for development projects. Uh, and it's, inter it's interesting, actually, because um, I remember that I had read somewhere that, um, you know, China didn't want, China was criticizing Taiwan for doing this because they said that it would foster corruption in, in the Falls, the Solomon Islands. And, uh, you know, it seemed that they're using the same mechanism. In terms of amounts, uh, you know, I think if I remember well, Taiwan was contributing to around, you know, eight to nine million dollars per year. China contributes to around like 11 million. So, I mean, so far. Uh, in the Solomon Islands as well, I think what uh, China does, and that's actually very interesting, is in that they're contributing to uh, uh, helping the country prepare for what uh, for the 2023 Pacific Games. So you know they they engage in those big infrastructure projects, um, and I think this is why you know like uh, the, the the amount of uh, Chinese aid in uh, in Solomon Islands is actually growing uh, quite a lot. In Kiribati, it's a different story. Um, what we found so far is that uh, Kiribati has um, had, you know, had received like uh, support from Taiwan uh, for agriculture projects, for some renewable energy projects, um, and so far we have we haven't actually seen China doing this. What we've seen is that uh, China is helping for um, the some you know some recovery grants, but they're very very tiny, uh, and those recovery grants are linked to the pandemic. But also, most interestingly, that they seem to be financing one of the two plans that uh, that would help, you know, Kiribati in developing its uh, tourism industry. Um, and you know, I've heard in the past that you know the the, um, the government the, Kirib the government of Kiribati had asked Taiwan to finance those plans, but the um, the Taiwanese aid program couldn't actually you know finance this kind of of of, um, of projects because it wasn't like actually a development project. It was more like you know giving money for uh, for transport for like a new plane, and uh, the, yeah, the, the the way the Taiwanese aid program was structured didn't allow this. Apparently, the way that China's aid program is, is uh, structured can uh, help for this. Mm, yeah, but but and, I mean that's very interesting in terms of the, speci the specifics. I mean, Australia is still doing a lot more though. At the end of the day, I don't I don't have the numbers at hand in my mind, but Australia is still doing a lot more. For example, to the extent that this. Oh partly a competition for influence. You know, that's the way things have gone to some extent, unfortunately. But um, Australia is still doing more yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah, as well. Different things. Exactly. So that's the that's actually a very interesting point is that um, 
uh, Australia, sorry, remain the, the main development partners in the Solomon Islands. Uh, but the thing is that we don't spend, uh, we don't use our money for flashy projects like this, you know, for like big, uh, big stadium or big, uh, big roads or whatever. We, like the, the way the Australian um, uh, aid program is structured in, in the Solomon Islands is mostly to focus on governance projects, on health projects. So we're trying to make uh, the government, the administration and the government of the city institution more um, and just a resilient. Um, we have, uh, I think Australia has um, a program called Employment and Economic Reforms, uh, which is really uh, to, yeah, to, to strengthen those, those, the, the administration over there. And in Kiribati, it's very much uh, focused on health. Um, and yes, again, you know, like uh, Australia used to be, uh, or was, or sorry, is the, the, the main development partners. But what's interesting is also to see like how quickly um, China is picking up, you know, like when we're comparing numbers, Yes, Australia sits at the top, and it's actually the same story uh, when you look at the Pacific global, uh, the Pacific as a region as a whole. You know, Australia is contributes every year to around 40 to 44 percent of the total development assistance to the Pacific, except in 2020 mm. when uh, the ADB actually, as I showed in my presentation, tripled and became the first development partners. But in any other, any other years, you know, Australia is by far the first development partners by, by yeah providing so around 40 percent of of the the aid. China uh, over the years has stabilized at around 8% in 2020, it decreased a little bit by five to 5%. And so I think this is the same story that you see here in, in, in Kiribati and the Solomon Islands. You know, Australia is really uh, far beyond all the other development partners. But if China continues like the way it has, uh, continue on the rhythm that, that it has taken since 2019, then, you know, like it will quickly uh, catch up. Mm. Um, Henry, I, I know it's, it's always a difficult issue, but I wanted to bring you in on just the geopolitics of aid and development finance and assistance in the Pacific. I mean, um, what's the view in, in your own sort of view and the view from the region um, in terms of how is this affecting development assistance? Because um, it's clearly complicating things in a significant way. There's, there's more money flowing in in some, in some senses, but there's also different tensions perhaps with uh, development effectiveness as well. Um, Vinaka, thank you so much, uh, Roland, for that question. Um, uh, if uh, you're correct, uh, geopolitics is a bit sensitive for me, uh, given that I'm a regional civil servant and uh, our members are um, sovereign nations uh, with uh, their own foreign policies. And some of our members are donors and some of our members are, are receivers of uh, this development assistance. Uh, perhaps um, I can probably say that from a uh, development lens, I can um, see that the benefits of geopolitics at the moment is that it's highlighting, as I touched on earlier, it's highlighting our ongoing uh, issues and vulnerabilities. Uh, I, I see that uh, the geopolitics is this opportunity or an opportunity to discuss them, to uh, coordinate, collaborate, and uh, propose uh, new solutions. Uh, I, I guess overall, what I what I would say, and I just is basically just listening to Alex uh, touching and Meg touching on the um, assistance that Australia has provided in terms of uh, the development assistance, also the Chinese assistance, is probably say that uh, at the end of the day, we're all earthlings. Uh, I, I, and uh, from a Pacific perspective, I don't think we're uh, that keen to be taking away from other 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 colleagues and brothers in the other regions in the, in the global world. Uh, what I would encourage then is to say that uh, we have seven, uh, SDG 17.2, uh, which is the uh, global uh, target for 0.7% of uh, ODA to GNI. Uh, what I'll say is this to encourage the geopolitics, uh, that all these uh, discussions would lead to an overall um, increase in meeting uh, this uh, UN uh, SDG 17.2 um, target. Uh, th thank you, Henry. I, th I mean, I think it is important, uh, as you raised, to try and focus on, you know, there are a lot of various pressures going on, but how can they be used in a constructive manner to forward sustainable development, particularly in, in the Pacific region, because uh, that's what we're, we're focusing on. I mean, one of the new initiatives is, is, is uh, coming from, uh, you know, the traditional partners in the, called the, the Partners of the Blue Pacific uh, Initiative. Um, which is trying to, you know, really bring greater coordination and cohesion from traditional partners in backing the Pacific's um, own agenda. You know, so this is, I think, a response to some of the changing international dynamics around 
what's happening in the Pacific as well. I'd like to get all of your your thoughts on that, but maybe I'll just start with you, Meg, in terms of what do you make of this this new initiative? I find it a bit problematic to be to be honest. Uh, at one level, it is positive because it's responding to the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific saying, which has been said repeatedly by the Pacific, we need more coordination, we need more collaboration. The increased competition is straining small systems with limited resources. So in that sense, it's a, a positive response. The problem is it, it's a catchy title, but what's behind it and trying to understand what's behind it. So we know it, the five partners that have uh, signed up to this to begin with, but there's others about to join, but we don't know the criteria for membership. And I think we need to know that. And the Pacific needs to know that. Uh, there is a commitment for coordination and collaboration, but we have little detail at the moment on how that's going to happen. <laughs> What is the coordinating mechanism? How does that relate to the Pacific Island Forum? And for instance, after each leaders forum, uh, except for the last one because of different circumstances, but there is a donor dialogue that occurs. So is this in addition to, uh, is this something that may ultimately replace it? It's just unclear. We have, and I'm, I'm sure Henry can talk more about it, but a review of the regional architecture, and it's not clear if the traditional donors are signaling a different way of collaboration or it's just an initiative that is going to sit outside of it. So I think in theory, it's a great idea to coordinate and collaborate. In practice, this particular initiative needs more detail. It needs more connection to uh, the already pre-existing regional institutions. Uh, and yeah, just a, a greater and more clear narrative about what's its purpose, how is it going to operate, uh, and who's involved, who's not involved, and why that is the case. Alex, do, do you want to comment on? Yeah, this? I mean, I would just say that uh, I, I'm very much aligned with what Meg uh, commented on, which is like, I think it's a very good opportunity for development partners to uh, increase their coordination, because yeah, at the end of the day, like, um, what you see in the Pacific aid map is that we have like 67 different development partners involved in the Pacific. Um, but at the end of the day, the reason we build the Pacific aid map is that because we've heard that it was difficult to know who was doing what in the region and to what extent. And so I think, yes, like this, this initiative is a good one. Other, initiative, you know, other similar initiative would actually contribute to maybe increase aid effectiveness in the Pacific with so better coordination, transparency, and so forth. But I completely agree with you. We still, at, it seems that we're still at an early, early stage. Uh, there are many things to 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 be defined in this uh, partner of the Blue Pacific. So, yeah, I'm I'm impatient to see what it's going to lead to. Yeah, very good. What about Henry? Can I ask you what what are, what is your thoughts and perspectives on the partners of the Blue Pacific Initiative? Well, thank you, Roland, and I I fully agree with uh, both what Alex and uh, Meg uh, have uh, touched upon. Uh, it's still early stages. There's a lot of issues and a lot of uh, questions to be answered. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, Meg, that will be part and parcel of the uh, uh, regional architecture work, which is uh, we are now working on or commencing on. So it's uh, as a uh, as Alex said, it's still early stages. And uh, I guess what we all all hope for is that uh, there will be communication, collaboration, and coordination uh, for better development effectiveness going forward. Um, now we actually have uh, some questions. Uh, uh, some video questions that we've collected uh, from people uh, in the region, which we'd like to play. And then I'll get uh, our panel members to, to answer uh, those questions. So if we could uh, play the first question, please. In an increasingly challenging world, we find ourselves adapting to changes, external forces and global crisis. And we ask the eight question, how can things be done differently? One classic example is the COVID-19 pandemic. When the world closed its borders, we couldn't fly in our mission experts and technical consultants to the ground in the Pacific. And while that posed a challenge for the region, I saw that as an opportunity. It was an opportunity for our people to step up, an opportunity for them to strengthen their leadership, their skills, and their ownership of the development programs that they should be managing and running. So the question I'd like to ask is, how do we strengthen this aspect of aid in strengthening local capacities on the ground in the Pacific? 
Okay, so the question is about um, uh, how can development partners you know, improve upon what's happened during the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of because of the border restrictions, um, you know, they haven't been able to fly in all the international advisors that so have to rely more on local capacity, local experts, consultants, officials. You know, this is a good thing. So how can it be built upon uh, going forward? Maybe I'd ask you, Meg, if you yeah. want to answer that question. I think it's an excellent question. And I have to sort of say that I did do a research project during the, the COVID period about how localization actually worked. And I have to say not only our own research, but that of the Red Cross Pacific, that of the Humanitarian Advisory Group, came to the same conclusion that the response was better. It was more streamlined, more targeted to priorities, more supportive of institutions, local institutions. So absolutely, it's about how we lock that in and don't just sort of slide back to the way things are as soon as the borders open. Uh, what was asked of us is to find ways not only just to co-design, but to co-deliver. So the head of a civil society organization said uh, that we don't just want to be service delivery people. Uh, we want to be involved in delivering and well, delivering, designing and evaluating. Uh, I think as well, and this is happening in some countries in the Pacific, is protocols that make sure when people intervene, they are meeting local needs. And as researchers, we can't get research permits unless we put in an application and we demonstrate the value to the Pacific Island country where we want to work. And so there is this concept of accountability. It's not just accountable to the money giver, it's accountable to the people who receive. And I think Finally, uh, some great initiatives were started because of the locked border, the Pacific Humanitarian Pathway, uh, and indeed the Black Rock facility, which is a regional facility in Fiji for humanitarian response and disaster risk reduction. And the idea is the first responder should be the region. Uh, and they should be working together and responding and setting the pathways uh, for the delivery of assistance and recovery uh, and a reduction of uh, the vulnerability of these countries. So we do have the foundations on which to build. And I think it's not only about the donors, it's also about the Pacific Island countries and the regional agencies locking that in, putting up protocols and holding the system so that it goes forward. It doesn't slide back to old ways. Mm. Oh, thanks for that. Thank you for that, Meg. I might ask Henry if he wants to comment on that as well. But actually, our next question touches on similar issues. So why don't we hear um, from our next uh, video question and then we'll turn to Henry to, to build on, on some of these arguments. Through two decades of geopolitical shifts, natural disasters, elections and regime changes, and technology-driven transformations, two things remain relatively unchanged in the Pacific, high aid dependency and low aid effectiveness. With the recent influx of aid and attention from development partners to the region, my question is one of agenda setting and power sharing. Aid is a thriving industry in the Pacific, comprising an ecosystem of actors. And the role these actors get to play in setting the agenda and co-developing and co-leading aid programs has often depended on their proximity to the donor. Local partners have shown leadership in articulating and demonstrating the changes that they would like to see to this power dynamic. And it has been heartening to hear that development partners are indicating a willingness to listen, to learn and to share power. My question is, will the array of resets and step ups to the Pacific include local voices in setting the agenda and sharing power and accountability through co-developing and co-leading aid programs? Okay, so another, another question we have from the region again, looking at whether or not all the talk about resets and step ups can be um, uh, targeted towards actually strengthening uh, Pacific leadership of, of development and development assistance in the region. Um, Henry. Could we ask you to offer your perspective on this question? Um, thank you so much, uh, Roland. And uh, it's it's interesting questions, and I, I guess um, I'll probably try and illustrate it uh, using the sustainable development goals. Um, the SDGs are once approved by um, leaders at the UN uh, platform. Uh, is implemented through uh, linkages to national plans, the sector plans, the budgets, 
and activities. Uh, this provides the um, um, process of accountability throughout in terms of uh, the different layers, uh, in terms of uh, the activities that are required on the ground running to address the different issues and vulnerabilities or projects that's required by the member country. Uh, at the same time, it also recognizes that the different platforms provides the opportunity for different stakeholders to participate in the decision-making process and also to influence uh, the projects and activities that are being implemented, uh, all aligned to the overall SDG global target that uh, we've been, uh, there was approved or everybody um, signed up to in uh, the UN uh, platform. So you've got an uh, alignment of uh, implementation, which provides those um, platforms for, um, for accountability and for discussion and stakeholder participation. But you also have an opportunity there to recognize the different champions at the different levels, uh, because with uh, implementation of changes, of, uh, of uh, tackling of different projects and pro different issues, you need uh, not only good leadership at the top, but you also need leadership at the different platforms and different uh, levels of, uh, of action. And I guess uh, the SDG, SDG implementation throughout our membership here in the Pacific uh, is an indication of how this has been thought of and how we have uh, tried to address the issues that's been raised by the questions. Uh, at the global level, countries have a, a voluntary uh, national reporting process to do back at the uh, to the UN at uh, in July of the high level uh, political platform discussions. So those are the different uh, levels of um, of accountability and reporting back. Uh, I I think uh, illustrates the the level of work that's done behind the scenes to implement and to improve effectiveness and to promote leadership, accountability, and stakeholder discussion. Oh, th thank you, thank you, Henry, for for elaborating on all of that. Um, we'll go to the last um, video question that we have, which it now brings in the issue of climate change. Climate change is the single most existential threat to Pacific peoples, our development, aspirations, and the security of our future. Our question is, how has COVID-19 changed or impacted the aid environment for addressing climate change in the Pacific? Okay, so the question there is about the relationship uh, between aid and climate change and how has the COVID-19 crisis and all of these shocks, how has that um, affected that, that situation, the link between aid and, and climate change? Um, Alex, I'll, I'll bring you in on this one. What yeah. are your thoughts? Uh, well, I mean, it's true that uh, during the whole, you know, COVID pandemic, we've seen like a massive increase in funding in the Pacific through loans, and but those loans were mostly directed to, as we explained before, you know, like they were mostly budget support loans that were there to help uh, Pacific Island countries fight liquidity issues and also help them, you know, find social protection uh, uh, projects. But you know, like the Pacific is one of the most fragile regions when it comes to development uh, to uh, to climate change. Um, and you know, some nations are facing when the, 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 the when they're facing the natural natural disasters, they're basically uh, facing like the, the the suppression of many points of their own GDP. And so, really, adapt adaptation should be central to um, to uh, the, the should be central to financing the the the, the, the recovery in the Pacific. Um, and I think so. This is what we we need to really focus on, you know, like to make sure that um, this that we are like targeting, like we are channeling our our financing through like a green green recovery in some ways, um, so that we make sure that you know not only like the Pacific is recovering quickly, but in a resilient way. Mm. No, it's very very important. I mean, I think the the region is so vulnerable to natural disasters, and as Henry pointed out earlier earlier in our conversation, that that can never be forgotten even when we're dealing with other shocks like COVID-19 or, you know, the ramifications of, of Russia's invasion uh, in the Ukraine. So, you know, super important uh, point. Uh, we're nearing the end of our sort of time allocation for this discussion. So I want to close out by sort of asking uh, our panel to, to look forward in terms of where things are headed. Um, we might start with you, Alex. I mean, you've, through the aid map, you've analysed the past trends. Mm -hmm. You can sort of <clears throat> now peer into the future. You know, where do you think things are going? What do you think are some of the key trends that are going to 
you know, extend beyond, you know, 2020 into some of your preliminary results for 21, 20, 2022, but also actually beyond that? What do yeah. you see as some of the key trends? Well, I mean, look, I can't tell you what the, what the future holds, uh, but one thing that I, that I think will, will continue will be the use of uh, ex loans, financial, you know, financial lending uh, to the Pacific. Uh, we realize that actually, you know, direct budget support is um, is a very good and efficient way to provide quick and direct financing to to the Pacific. And you know, the economic recovery in the Pacific is not going as quickly as in other parts of the world. So uh, the region will continue to need uh, uh, extensive financial support, as we could uh, we talked about. You know, a green economic recovery would be great. Uh, there's a the story of the vaccines as well, you know, like, I mean, um, we still, you know, in, in the aid map, uh, because the aid map closes in 2020, you won't see vaccines for this year. But actually in the data we've already collected, you know, we've already um, have preliminary, preliminary data for 2021. And there you can see like the distribution of vaccine in the Pacific. That has been actually, uh, if you think about it, like a pretty good, good story. Like uh, some Pacific nations were among the first to be vaccinated in the Pacific. Um, some others, like um, you know, Papua New Guinea, uh, Solomon Islands, are still struggling to uh, to cover the whole uh, population. But like the vaccine, um, the vaccine delivery by development partners to the Pacific has actually been quite successful. So we'll see this uh, going going in the future. And I think yeah, a bigger climate focus will will be definitely something we'll will see more uh, donors um, pay attention to. Mm, mm, very important, Henry. Your thoughts in terms of looking ahead. What do you think the key trends are and, and, and how do you think that, how appropriate do you think that is and what would you like to see happen? Um, thank you, uh, Roland, for the question. Um, uh, I can only uh, say that uh, here in the Pacific, uh, our members, our leaders um, endorse our development uh, strategy, the 2050 uh, strategy for the Blue Pacific uh, continent. It's uh, basically a um, people-centered development um, approach it's um, putting in cultural uh, values, looking at us, uh, ourselves as a large ocean state and um, seeing ourselves uh, working together with uh, as uh, people collectively uh, using the Pacific way. Uh, and I see that our issues remain the same in terms of climate change, COVID-19 uh, waves that I talked to earlier, gender, uh, connectivity and technology, uh, growth and infrastructure. Those are just some of the issues that we deal with on a daily basis. So Meg, we'll give you the last word in terms of future mm -hmm. trends and what you'd like to see happen. I think the big lesson here is that aid can grow, aid can change, it can pivot, uh, and it can be flexible. And there's always been the assumption that it's a bit like a tanker, it can't move easily. I think COVID tells us otherwise. I think the financing story and the potential debt distress says to me that in the end, it's people who manage these systems. And if we don't invest in the people going forward, we've got a problem and we need human development as well as infrastructure. We need to think about the youth, which is growing rapidly and needs investment. We need education, we need skills. And for those analyzing this tool, I think there's a wealth of information there, but don't forget that development is more than aid. And so we do have to look at the other complementary schemes in the private sector, labor mobility uh, and diplomacy and what's happening there. And that needs a big microscope, I think as well. Thank you, Meg. Ex excellent points uh, to close on. Let me thank uh, Alex in particular uh, for his presentation and comments uh, through the panel, as well as Meg and Henry uh, for join joining us for this, this excellent uh, panel discussion. Lots of important points and lots of uh, important data and information in the Pacific Aid Map. So hopefully, you know, this is just the start of the conversation mm -hmm. around uh, this latest edition of the, the, the Pacific Aid Map. So thank you uh, to our audience for joining us for this discussion of the 2022 Lowy Institute uh, Pacific Aid Map. Uh, if you haven't already, please check out the map online at our website or simply Google Pacific Aid Map and it should turn up. We're also publishing a number of articles on our digital magazine, The Interpreter, featuring a range of voices uh, from the Pacific aid and development uh, community uh, to provide their own perspectives on the findings uh, in the Pacific aid map. So please check out those as well. Thanks also to our events and digital team for their support in this event. And finally, to our audience, thanks again for joining us and we look forward to you joining us next time. Thank you. Thank you.